Welcome to the Weekly Takeaway, what you need to know from the news. And again, if you've been watching over the last couple of weeks, you know that the purpose of this show is to help you cut through kind of the clutter and all of the noise associated with what's happening in our world and get down to the point where we can ask the question, how does this apply to me? What is my takeaway from what I'm learning, what I'm seeing, and what I'm experiencing? We've had a busy news week. Again, if you get on social media, if you watch the news or listen to the news, I don't need to tell you that, but there is always something going on. And this week has been one of those weeks. Some of the big stories from the last few weeks have kind of faded into the background, and this has been a week of a lot of politics and political talk and some global talk, many smaller things that we've been discussing in the past, but things that are very relevant to our lives. I think we'll be caught up in the political cycle, the the thoughts and statements of our president, the Democratic uh, nomination process and all that's going on there, probably until November when we get to the other side of that with our president, who knows? He's always spinning things up, so we'll continue to talk about the things that he's dealing with and the things that he's saying. One of the things this week that he got involved in that really brings up an issue that a lot of folks are talking about is with the uh, the process that one of his friends is going through right now in the courts. In fact, uh, today, the sentencing of Roger Stone, a friend of President Trump, someone who was involved in his campaign early on, uh, some things were done, some things were done that were illegal, <laughs> and he was sentenced today. The sentence guidelines, or the sentencing guidelines as issued by the Attorney General's office, were something that were not satisfactory to the President, and so he weighed in on that. He weighed in, as he typically does on social media, by calling out the the recommended recommended sentence as being too harsh. Uh, Again, uh, an interesting process, and it really brings up some very interesting questions. On the other side of that social media push by the president, our attorney general, Attorney General William Barr, uh, did make a recommendation to the judge presiding over the case that the sentencing recommendations would be lowered. And this started, again, as you can imagine, maybe you've heard or read, started a firestorm within the uh, attorney general's office and throughout our kind of judicial system, federally at least. A lot of folks upset and a lot of people screaming about the president's interference in a a criminal case because the person involved in that case is a friend of his. So many issues, and we could talk about all of them. But some that I think are important for us to consider, some takeaways for me from this whole process. Uh, Here's one of the takeaways. We have a president that when he says things, when he talks to people, He does it in a very public way. I don't think any of us would argue that presidents in the past have called in their attorneys general and talked about whatever's happening in the judicial system and making personal recommendations, probably in a closed door meeting. Our president, although he may do that, (laughs) typically brings things out in the open. His favorite platform for doing so is Twitter, and he'll put out tweets that talk about his thoughts, what he expects, what he anticipates, what he sees as fair, what he sees as unfair, talking about those that he likes and those that he doesn't like. This was one of those cases. And again, some takeaways for me as I look at this, one is the question of how transparent do we want our president to be? It's been argued that the Attorney General's office, the um, what he oversees in the federal uh, court system, the judges that he oversees, really fall under the executive branch of our government. Uh, The president, as the chief executive, then is the boss of those folks that he can uh, influence if he desires to do that. He can make recommendations. He can steer that ship. Uh, Really, he has the right to do that, as he said, but does he have uh, the responsibility? Should he do that? These are the questions we need to ask. But as he does that, And again, I think we'd agree that other presidents have done the same. Does he need to do that in a closed-door session, or does he need to do it publicly? Maybe a bigger question is, what do we, as the citizens who elect a president and who elect, uh, elect our legislators, what do we expect from the president? Do we want a president that keeps these things out in the open, that that helps us to understand what he's thinking and what he's uh, planning on doing and who he likes and who he doesn't like? Is that what we want, or do we want someone with a different decorum? We are living in a strange space right now. 
It's a space where normal things, the the norms of legislation and how people were supposed to act and the things they were supposed to say and the things they were not supposed to say, uh, these were perhaps unwritten, but rules that people generally ascribe to. But now it seems like everyone is in everyone else's lane, including our president. Is this something that we as the government want to see continuing forward? This is a question. And it's a question that we have the ability to influence. If we like what we're seeing, we can influence that, continuing to vote and support. If we don't, then we need to decide who it is that we want to put in front of other politicians, who we want to vote for, and who we want to get behind. Should the president influence a court trial that's taking place right now? We could say yes, or we could say no, but we know it happens. How should he do that? What responsibility does he have when he sees things that are unjust, if any? On the other side of that, the question is, what should the Attorney General do? He's, his resignation has been called for, as you can imagine. But should he resign? Should he press on? Should he continue? You know, we'll see what happens. But these are questions that we as Americans need to answer. Do we want a transparent process or not? Do we want a president who uses his influence to get what he wants, these other areas that we have generally considered off limits, or not? What is it that we want, and how can we help uh, our politicians get to the place that we want them to be? That's a huge discussion, but one we need to spend some time thinking about. Uh, The second big news item this week, this is an interesting one, it just happened. The next Democratic National Uh, campaign debate as folks are vying for the position of the nominee that will meet the president in the general election. Another debate took place this week in Nevada. An interesting debate. If you haven't watched it, do yourself a favor. Go find some clips. (laughs) It was a melee. People screaming at each other, trying to put each other down. You can see the desperation that some of these candidates are uh, experiencing right now as they do their best to make their voices heard and push out those that they think could steal the nomination away from them. One of the new people on the stage was Michael Bloomberg. You've heard of him, I'm sure. The mayor of New York, a billionaire who worked very hard, as he stated last night, to become a billionaire, worth many, many billions of dollars. What's interesting is this is the first debate that he's been a part of. In fact, he said that he was running for president late into this process when the other uh, folks who are running had already put their hat, hat in the ring. He came along, but he has been surging in the polls basically for one reason. Because he has a lot of money, because he's self-funding his campaign, and because everywhere you look right now, you're seeing an advertisement, whether it's on social media or network television or other places that you would consume media. He he is uh, advertising in a way, because he has the money and the influence to do it, that has brought attention to him and to his campaign, and he's surging in the polls. The interesting thing about that surge is that up until the debate this week, uh, really we hadn't seen him on a stage trying to push forward his ideas and parry off the ideas of others. This week we did, and it didn't go well for him. (laughs) The other candidates piled on him and really tried to take him down, and in a lot of ways I think did an effective job. On the other side of this debate, Michael Bloomberg himself said the real winner from the debate tonight was President Trump. He said that because what he observed and what he experienced standing on that platform was the candidates who hoped to beat Donald Trump in a general election destroying one another, tearing each other down. The problem with this, in this nominating process, is that by the time the general election comes, the candidates are going to be so beat down, if they even make it, that they're going to have very little chance to beat a strong president in a general election. Uh, So many takeaways here. One of the big ones is this. How do we feel, as a nation and as citizens, about a man entering the race for president and really doing so because he has the money to influence public thought? Now again, we could make the argument that every candidate has bought their way into this election cycle or this election process. A case could certainly be made for that. But this is a man who stayed out of the normal process, 
and decided that instead he would just buy his way in, and he has. Uh, The takeaway there, as I consider what's happening, is that I'm not sure I'm happy (laughs) to be governed by someone who has one strong quality, a bank account that allows him to buy his way into the election. This is certainly something to consider. Michael Bloomberg, again, as he was talking about what happened during the debate, uh, really, I think, put his finger on something that's important for the Democrats to understand. He said that the other folks on the stage are preaching to such a narrow audience, to such a small audience. In fact, the front runner, uh, Bernie Sanders, has such a small yet very devoted audience that if he becomes the nominee, he could not possibly win in a nationwide election. I don't know that Michael Bloomberg has a more broad appeal than any of the others, but an interesting point. We'll certainly see what happens. We'll have a takeaway on the other side of this to look back and understand all that's gone on. This week, as well, outside of politics, we learned that the Boy Scouts of America, who recently changed their name to the Scouts to accommodate uh, both genders, that they filed for bankruptcy. After a long and storied career, a long and storied history, a history of building boys into young men and young men into future leaders of our country, instilling character and virtue and values. After a long history of doing all of these things, they declared bankruptcy because they could no longer handle the financial burden that was placed on them by lawsuits because of sexual exploitation and sexual assaults and sexual sins within the context of the various groups of the Boy Scouts. Again, so many takeaways here. As I consider the Boy Scouts, they are the all-American institution. They are the institution that represents where we have come from as a nation and what we've always believed as a nation. It's about character. It's about being the person really you were created to be. The Boy Scouts, it's about being the men that you were created to be, about leading your homes and leading your families and leading your communities. This is what the Boy Scouts has always stood for. And now as they fizzle out, what they will represent is an organization that decided to walk away from its moorings, walk away from its character as an organization And to do something it had never done that led to a place, ultimately, that put the members, the young men, in danger and caused the kind of problem that we hope to never see anywhere, particularly in the institutions we trust the most. Uh, This is not new. We've seen this in churches. We've seen this in leaders that we trust. We've put our confidence in those who have demonstrated a long history of being people worthy of placing our confidence in, only to see so many of those people fall on the other side. Perhaps the Boy Scouts will figure out a way to uh, come back, (laughs) to get back to the place they once were. We don't know. Only time will tell. But the takeaway as we consider that story is this. We must instill character. We must instill virtue. We must put those things above so many of the other things that we care about. The the Boy Scouts of America become, in a lot of ways, a social experiment. What was meant to teach young men how to be older men, how to be leaders in our communities, became a social experiment, became something it was never intended to be, pushing aside virtue and pushing aside character in so many ways to become something it was not intended to be, and to become something that in a lot of ways is harmful. We need to look to our institutions and focus on character, and focus on doing right, and focus on moving forward in a way that represents who we actually are. We'll see what happens. But regardless of what happens with the Boy Scouts, we can be determined to be people of character who teach others how to be people of character. The last story I'll touch this week. There are so many, but this is one that's in the news. You can't avoid it. You can't get around it. Uh, This is the story of the coronavirus. Now, every week I say, I'm not going to talk about it again. (laughs) It's the big story. I'm not talking about it. I keep talking about it. I'm not going to talk about it again. I have to talk about it again because it's a big story. And there are so many takeaways. I'll tell you my takeaway this week, particularly as I consider uh, much of what's happening in our own politics right now and what's happening in the world and discussions about what's right and what's wrong in a political sense. 
We know that in China, the coronavirus is a big deal. People are contracting it. People are getting sick. Uh, folks have lost their lives. All of these things are happening. But the way that it's been dealt with is that the government, a communist government, a government that has control over everything, has simply decided that it would quarantine whoever it wants to, limiting their freedom and liberty. Perhaps it's justified, we don't know. But beyond that, anyone who reports anything negative about the country of China in their handling of this situation or what's happening in this situation will be punished. And just this week, a couple of Wall Street Journal uh, journalists who have been there reporting on this were thrown out of the country because of their reporting. We're told that some have lost their lives because they've reported illegally on what's happening in China. Others calling out for help have just disappeared. Many, even in the Communist Party, have been thrown out of the Communist Party because of their criticism over how these things have been handled. Again, take that for however you would like, whatever uh, perspective you want to have on that. But here's what I see. I see in the United States a group of folks who want to be the next president of the United States, many of whom ascribe to socialistic policies. Uh, Bernie Sanders is someone who describes himself as a socialist. He has a long history of being a socialist. The other candidates may not be as socialist as he is, but certainly would ascribe to many of the same policies. A socialist is someone who, if gone far enough, if they go far enough, will become a communist. Socialism in a country, and this is a conversation we're having right now, becomes communism in a country. And when communism becomes the party control is removed from the people, it's given to the government, and every aspect of life is then controlled by the government, including the freedom of speech and the ability to criticize what's happening in that government. As I look at what's happening in China, uh, again, so many things we could talk about, but one of the big takeaways for me is that what we're seeing in China illustrates so well where a country like the United States could end up if we put our arms around the ideals of socialism and let, uh, uh, let those, those ideals, carry us into the next stage, which is a communist regime that cares far less about its people than it does power. Bunch of stories. Lots of them. <laughs> Lots of stuff happening this week. And I hope you're keeping track of all of these things. I hope you're staying on top of it. My job, what I hope to do as we come together every week, is to cut through some of that clutter and help us get to the place where we can say, what do I need to know from this, and how can I move forward? And I hope that's happening. If you have not yet, please go ahead and like this, uh, this uh, channel, like and subscribe. Go ahead and comment. A lot of comments have come in the last few weeks. Some good, some helpful, some not so much. Either way, go ahead and comment. Love to hear from you, and we'll get back together next week. Hope you have a good weekend.